All right, I think we have all of our technical stuff worked out. So we're going to kick things off um, today. I'm Sue Hendrickson, the executive director of the Berkman Klein Center. And today we are thrilled to welcome at uh, BKC the authors of Choke Point Capitalism for a conversation on the twin monopolies of big tech and big content. Uh, their new book uh, highlights how copyright law is not enough to stop corporations from rigging markets to exploit creative labor. Uh, a quick note that while this event is being recorded, no audience spaces will be seen. Uh, moderating, moderating today, we are lucky to have our own Rebecca Tishnet, Frank Stanton Professor of the First Amendment at Harvard Law School and a director here at BKC. Rebecca is an expert on copyright, trademark, and false advertising law, and was a co-founder of the Organization for Transformative Works, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting and promoting fan works. Uh, Rebecca, I'll leave it to you to introduce our guests and kick off. Thank you all for being here, and we look forward to the discussion. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Um, hopefully, let's see, uh, hopefully I'm hearable. Um, so, uh, uh, Rebecca and Corey are uh, are prominent voices uh, in uh, the the global uh, discussions of open culture. Uh, Rebecca is a professor at Melbourne Law School and director of the IP Research in Institute of Australia, um, and doing very exciting work. Um, Corey is, uh, is also a, a great author uh, who's written some of my favorite intellectual property themed science fiction stories. Uh, and I actually have more than like, I have a list, uh, but uh, his are high up there and uh, a great supporter of open culture and transformative works, which is where uh, I've encountered him many years ago. And I'm so excited to be here and talk about choke point capitalism. So I wanna jump right into it. We will have time for questions later, uh, but I wanna pose some questions to you guys uh, so that you can uh, introduce us to the book. So I want to start with something, a quote that comes early in the book, um, which I love, and I hope you'll elaborate on it, which is giving more copyright to creators who are struggling against powerful buyers is like giving more lunch money to your bullied kid. So can you talk about sort of uh, what, what led you to that? <laughs> Corey, do you want to go first? Let's uh, get Sure. Yeah. Happy to. And and hi, Rebecca and Rebecca and everyone there at uh, Berkman Klein. I'm sorry I can't be with you there in person today. Uh, what I realized, Corey, is that, you know, there's all those stats about how there's more like Fortune 500 companies run by men called John than like women. We've got more women called Rebecca. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, but okay, do the, do the proper stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, so look, for 40 years, there's been this paradox in that we have expanded monotonically the scope of copyright, the duration of copyright, the ease with which you can bring a copyright action, the statutory damages for violating copyright. We've done it domestically, we've done it abroad. And, and despite all of that, the share of income going to creators from their creative work in virtually every field has declined precipitously and the total revenue has increased. And so the, the question is, how is it that this uh, regulatory framework that's supposed to provide the negotiating leverage that creators can use to extract value from other people in their supply chain so that they can feed their families and pay for a dignified retirement, and all that other good stuff, uh, how is it that it's not performing as advertised? And I think that there's a pretty easy kind of causal relationship uh, it, it, to trace that can explain why this is happening. And that's because the elements of copyright that do increase the negotiating leverage specifically of creators, specifically against intermediaries and investors have been systematically opposed by intermediaries and investors. And the other elements, the ones that are alienable have been supported by investors and uh, intermediaries. And investors, intermediaries, and creators are powerful political coalition. When they speak with one voice, they often get what they want. Um, but creators on their own are not, uh, and historically do not get their regulatory priorities when they diverge from those of the other elements of their supply chain. Meanwhile, those other elements of their supply chain, one of the reasons they are so powerful is because they've grown ever more concentrated. Uh, Tom Eastman, a software development from New Zealand, likes to say, I can remember when the web was more than five giant websites filled with screenshots of text from the other four. Uh, the consolidation of tech into just a few silos means that 
you have a small number of firms they extract extraordinary rents from elements of their supply chain and also often their customers and they can very easily arrive at a common negotiating position when it comes to both their supply chain and more importantly with regulators and lawmakers about what they demand the same is true and has been true for even longer and has become only more true of the entertainment sector where it's three record labels and four studios and four maybe five depending on the ftc publishers one movie theater one ebook seller one national book chain and so on i can do this all day long and so you end up with this circumstance in which anything that is alienable anything that a creator has that can be taken off of them as a condition of reaching their audience is by one or more of these kind of great beasts and where creators have been told for 40 years that the only way to remediate this is to pick one of these two titans team tech or team content and hope that when their wrestling match is over that the victor will reward their pathetic loyalty by dribbling a few more crumbs when they've done the the you know gorge themselves in the meal made of their labor and you know that is i think very analogous to this idea that your kid is getting bullied at the schoolyard gate and it doesn't matter how much lunch money you give them not even if the bullies use some of that lunch money to run a national campaign whose message is won't someone think of the bullied hungry school children give them more lunch money it's it's definitely not gonna help out those school kids and it would be naive to think that they would no matter whether those bullies were the people on the west gate or the east gate you know the spoiler alert last scene of uh, animal farm they look from the farmers to the men and the men to the farmer or the pigs to the men and the men to the pigs and they can't tell the difference so we tend to think of the US system as distinctive in a lot of ways, not just in copyright, but also in areas like antitrust. Why, 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 what made this a global problem? Why was no one able to uh, prevent this kind of consolidation? Well, partly because of American antitrust law being um, not so much the law that's on the books, but the decisions politically that were made about which parts of it to enforce against who and when has led to these enormous corporations growing up in the United States. And since the internet um, is global, that's really helped that, that march, that progression to be able to kind of colonize the entire world with these, with these, these frameworks. So if we look at YouTube, for example, you know, the fact that that's, that's originated in the United States with the, the antitrust law here and becomes so popular almost worldwide has given it sort of dominance that way. But when we talk about the antitrust issues here, um, I want to talk a little bit about why it is so difficult to enforce even the law that is on the books. And that's because we're not really dealing, well, we've got a problem here with monopoly, for sure. And we all know, we have some idea of what monopolies are because we had a board game for that, right? It's where you've got um, a seller who becomes really powerful, right? And they can exert that power over buyers, all right? And so we think about um, Amazon in its dealings with consumers. They've got such a strong share of the markets for so many consumer goods, including things like books. And they're able, they can use that power if they want to, to control um, the, the buyer side. But they're also a very, very powerful buyer. And when we have a very, very powerful buyer, um, they, that's called monopsony, right? And we don't have a board game for that. And also the word is horrible. Technically, we're talking about oligopsony usually, which is where you've got like a few very powerful buyers in a market. We tried to make this sexy in our book and everybody who read it said, you've got to take this out. Like you've got to stop saying this word, right? But we think we can make it sexy. So stay with me a little bit because it's really, really important. Um, monopsony accrues at way, so um, an example of a monopsony is Amazon in its interactions with publishers, right? So it's, in this case, it's the buyer, not the seller, but it exerts enormous control over those, those organizations, those, those businesses. And one of the, the really tricky things with monopsony is that it accrues at way lower market concentrations than you need for a monopoly. Okay, so even 8%, 10% of a market can give a buyer a lot of control over a seller. And we see that, for example, early on in um, Amazon's days, when uh, it, it started something called the Gazelle Project. Has anyone heard of this? Um, this is where they set out to deliberately target those smaller, weaker publishers and shake them down for ever big, bigger discounts so that they could fatten their margins. Um, and they've always been very clear about this. One of the famous Bezoisms is, your margin is my opportunity. Um, so they, they went after these small publishers. 
one of them in particular, Melville House, they resisted, right? And they said, no, 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 we, we, that just is not sustainable. We can't agree to those terms. And Amazon just responded by removing all the buy buttons for their books, right? And at that time, I think they did only control 8% or 10% of Melville House's market, but nonetheless, they had to give in, right? Because there was no substitute buyer for those books and the margins in the industry are so tight that if you lose those buyers that are controlled by Amazon, even at that concentration, then your business becomes unsustainable. And so we can see like if that is what happened, then the additional power that they've only got in the, the subsequent um, years has just made it harder and harder for, for suppliers to go anywhere but Amazon. And then there's a couple other uh, reasons why um, monotony is really tricky to address with antitrust law. And that includes the fact that traditional antitrust remedies, which are structural remedies, break them up. If you want to know about that, read the amazing book of the same name by Zephyr Teachout. Um, and conduct remedies, which is where you pinky swear that absolutely, if you're allowed to merge with that other company, Ticketmaster Live Nation, for example, you will not use that power to you know, uh, squeeze all your competitors. Uh, but then very often, they somehow do. Um, so those remedies are. are pretty tricky even in the context of monopoly, but they're far less useful in the context of monopsony. What we do know though, um, from the, the, lit the economics literature in this, is that there are three things that, that do really help. Um, one is by encouraging new entrants into a market. Another is by um, directly regulating buyer power. And another is by um, helping develop countervailing producer power and like help other suppliers and workers um, be able to get more power. <laughs> and so in this book, uh, we've steered away from the antitrust solutions. What we've really focused on is how can we widen out the choke points using those kinds of tools, a whole bunch of different, and sometimes pretty, we get into some pretty technical stuff, but how do we do all of those things in the context of the culture industries? And what kind of unthinking can that unlock to help us take these markets back? So one of the things that I found quite uh, provocative was uh, the idea that, so when you, your description of Amazon sounds a ton like the description of Walmart, mm -hmm. right? And before that, frankly, the description of Sears, mm -hmm. uh, which also did a similar thing with catalog sales to people who had not been reached um, by previous distribution channels. So um, uh, 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 I'd love it if you talk a little bit about the idea of creators as the canary in the coal mine. Uh, like what, what, why are creators the place to, to look for solutions to monopsony? Do you want to go, Corey? Or sure, yeah. So I think that um, creators are part of a, of a group of workers who uh, show up for work out of uh, a sense of mission um, and uh, out of a, a, almost a compulsion. This is a phenomenon that... Um, David Graeber describes in Bullshit Jobs, where he says that uh, there are classes of workers who are kind of normatively considered to be fair game for maltreating because their job is meaningful. And what more do you want, right? If you're gonna show up for work and come home at the end of the day, having feel, felt like you've made a difference and done something important, that should be reward enough, you teacher, you nurse, you doctor, you social worker, you creator. Uh, creators in particular uh, are notorious for doing work um, even when the, the work is badly compensated or not compensated at all and the conditions are exploitative. That this is, you know, summed up in a in a classic joke about the kid who runs away and joins the circus, and his his dad tracks him down and finds him shoveling elephant dung, and says, "Son, come home." And the the boy hefts his shovel and says, "What?" And quits show business. Um, so in in that world, uh, it is possible to lean on uh, creators as well as as people in other trades in ways that maybe um, Uber drivers wouldn't tolerate. You know, Uber drivers, you, you lock in by getting them to buy a special car for the thing and have them have to make uh, payments on and so on. But you don't lock them in by committing them to the vision of Uber as a new way to alter the urban landscape for the better or anything. It's, not, it's strictly a kind of material lock in, not an ideological one. Um, and I think that you're right that Sears and other large firms did try to create monopsonies and monopolies and to use lock-in and other tactics, Walmart being another very important example, uh, things like predatory pricing and also 
um, doing uh, exclusivity deals with distributors and so on in ways that compromise new market entrance ability to directly compete with Walmart. Um, all of that said, though, I think that the last 40 years, which which were were coterminal with the rise of, of Walmart, uh, are characteristic of another phenomenon in regulation, which is the uh, gradual abandonment of of most forms of antitrust enforcement. And so, you know, to 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 say, well, how how is this different from Walmart? We can say it's actually Walmart and this are both epiphenomena or downstream from. The decision to treat monopolies as presumptively efficient, to treat uh, a false positive and breaking up a, a monopoly that might have someday done some good as worse than the the false negative of uh, of, of uh, leaving a monopoly to fester even when it was doing harm. Those those policy priorities did produce some pretty ugly outcomes. Sears is a different circumstance, and and it it has its own. Uh, contours. Uh, it's such a such a uh, old business that to really discuss it properly, we would have to discuss it how it it you know torqued itself into different policy moments from the you know previous from two centuries ago until you know its death at the hands of a hedge fund manager. Uh, so that's a, I think a longer story. But I think Walmart is actually a really good example of kind of the same phenomenon. Yeah, and what we say in the book is that creative workers, we can see them as canaries in the coal mine, right? So yes, we know that people are uh, artists and more willing to paint a mural than to paint a fence for the same amount of money, um, or that they require more money to paint a fence. Um, but we also know that this, this feature of growing concentration means that fewer and fewer people are having, are having a choice. And the other kinds of things that businesses are using to facilitate worker lock-in include you know, the, the really um, outrageous misuse of non-compete clauses. They're supposed to you know, be protecting against sort of business secrets and things like that. But you know, increasingly companies, you know, McDonald's using it to stop you from going to work in Burger, Town in the, Burger King in the same town, right? Um, and you know, all sorts of um, confidentiality clauses, things like uh, prohibitions, contractual prohibitions on bringing class actions, which effectively deprive people of access to justice, all of these things are aimed at, at getting the same kind of lock-in, right? And the more that we permit that kind of thing, the less you know, worker choice there is. So what we say is that, sure, creators are further along this line um, because of those sort of those particular factors and because it can be easier to lock them in with some of the things like digital rights management that we talk about in the context of Amazon, the way that they lock all of your audiobooks with digital rights management to the Audible app, which makes it really hard to persuade people to go and use a different service for their audiobooks. Um, so th there's definitely some unique ways that you can lock in creative workers and creative investors. However, they're not the only ways that they're being locked in. And with COVID, what we saw was this sudden radical experiment that showed that, you know, lots of talk about how robots are gonna take manufacturing jobs, much less talk about the fact that all that separates people living in um, developed countries that are in high paying jobs at the moment is about 20 years of socialization and skills development, which we've now shown can all be done online, right? So if we permit this kind of continued concentration, what's to stop um, uh, everybody's jobs being taken and offered to the very lowest bidder and putting everybody um, in the, the same condition as these, these creative workers now? So uh, let me let me talk about uh, so the the sort of obvious uh, lines of pushback um, that I think are opened up by this, including the reference to the fact that you know uh, Sears rose and fell, uh, right? Walmart uh, now looks maybe more attractive uh, compared to Amazon, um, or and certainly Walmart no longer looks dominant uh, in in the same way. So. Uh, to, uh, I want you to react to two things. Uh, so first is the the standard tech line: competition is a click away, right? Uh, it's not actually hard to leave. Um, and one thing that you know Meta clearly feels bad about um, is TikTok, right? So it, you know it, TikTok has sort of eaten uh, Meta's lunch, which uh, is some evidence, right, that 
that there, there, there is potential for movement. And then of course the related thing is you were sort of mentioning American tech companies dominance. I have to say the current examples we have of their non-dominance are not very great, right? So in Russia, right, you have things that are owned by the state. In China, you know, you have bike dance. Is it better to get the stuff from, chi from China and Russia? Right. So uh, yeah, well, you clearly thought about this. So absolutely right. Um, and yes, that's always the argument that, uh, of course, you're going to be able to. The idea is that, of course, as soon as you've got monopoly profits, then um, then other people will sniff those and they will enter the market and the invisible hand will do its job. Right. Except what we're seeing, that's what we're talking about. Maybe I'll take a step back and talk. Rebecca, can I grab this copy of the book? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm going to start by explaining Amazon's flywheel. I think this is a good way of kind of getting to this. So you might have seen this. Amazon talks about it a lot as its virtuous cycle, right? So what it explains is it's got this lower cost structure. So it starts off by talking about how efficient it is, because that's a great thing that's very admired in competition law. Um, and then that leads to lower prices, uh, which improves the customer experience. That drives traffic to the site, it attracts more sellers, better selection, so they get more customers, and the cycle continues. Like it's all, it's all delightful, right? Um, what's really happening here, though, is Amazon is doing everything in its power to lock consumers in. Okay, and so think about Prime, for example. How many people here have Prime? Yeah, how can you not have Prime? What a deal, right? <laughs> it's such a deal. I have not been in the States for a couple of years. Um, for obvious reasons, I was locked in my island prison. It was illegal <laughs> to come or go. It was like living in Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. Um, and now we're allowed out again. I got back to New York and almost every package I feel being delivered had Prime take on it, right? I went to Whole Foods to get some groceries. I was offered lots of discounts if I wanted to maybe, you know, if I was a Prime member. Um, I was offered the opportunity to return my packages. There's absolutely no inconvenience to me if I was a Prime member and you get, you know, video rental and uh, all the freebies, right? But this is aimed at locking everybody in. So what the research shows that once you are a Prime member and you've paid for that free fast shipping up front, you want to get your value at it. So remarkably few people, I think just a few percent, actually do any kind of comparison shopping. They just go straight to Amazon, okay? But when all the, the shoppers are shopping at Amazon, that means the suppliers are locked in as well, okay? So uh, going, going to try and reach customers without that is a big inconvenience price to be the ones to actually find them because this is where people are increasingly finding finding people um, and then once the one so what we show we've got we made our own diagram with help from an amazing illustrator that we hired um, what they're really doing is they're locking in users they're using that to lock in suppliers they're using the profits from that to eliminate competitors because uh, that way there is no other choice and that reinforces those other parts and then they're forcing workers and suppliers to accept unfairly low prices so the, the money that they make from this, so we know that they use it um, on kill zones so that venture capitalists are very reluctant to invest in a company that's going to come into Amazon's, you know, one of its markets where it's sort of staked out some territory. Amazon spent $200 million in a single month to defeat diapers.com, right? And that might seem expensive as a way to, to get the market for nappies, but it's very cheap as sending a message to other people don't even try it all right um and we also see a really whenever you when you have monopolies and monopsonies that have grown this strong it buys regulatory influence as well and power and that can be used to prevent the the laws that are on the books from being enforced against these companies um Corey, do you want to add anything to that um, I, I think that you you make a good point. I, I want to talk about, you know, the entry of TikTok and, and other firms. I think that that's not inconsistent with the uh, um, with the account that we make. I, I think that part of our account is that when firms are very concentrated, they are able to forestall effective regulation or even worse, make regulation that is um, uh, counter to the public interest and in their own interest. And there is always the risk when that happens that someone else will come in with a, even more access to the capital markets and exploit that fertile ground that they have that they've prepared right that you know TikTok can come in and take advantage of the fact that uh facebook and google have spent 40 years preventing us for 20 years rather preventing us from getting a, a decent privacy law on the federal books with a private right of action and can launch this extraordinarily invasive product 
without uh, without the kind of regulatory obstacles they might otherwise have faced, much in the same way that a lot of the regulatory battles that Walmart won prepared the ground for Amazon. Um, so it is possible that you'll get new market entrants. Um, they, his, they are unlikely to be the kinds of market entrants that are favorable to creators. And even when they are, that favor can be short-lived and is in any event um, uh, extremely contingent uh, so, you know, one of the chapters in this book is about the, the arrangements that the labels made with Spotify, you know, because the labels had acquired uh, most of their competitors, often at fire sale prices in the wake of the Napster Wars, uh, they, they held this huge trove of copyrights, which they could use to essentially ensure that Spotify couldn't enter the market without a deal with them. Part of that deal included equity. Um, those labels were able to structure deals with with Spotify that made it look more profitable than it was, or like it had more revenue than it did by agreeing to take lower amounts for streams, which meant higher amounts for dividends, which also meant a bigger IPO pop and more money in in uh, capital gains. Um, but uh, the the um, other thing to note here is that um, this large market entrant uh, allowed the labels to reverse their course. Uh, that they had been on since the rise of YouTube and, and other prod products and services that actually did somewhat challenge their hegemony, including the ability to sell direct in the Amazon MP3 store and the iTunes store, where the labels made their deals better uh, for artists because they knew that those artists might be able to toddle off and get a better deal out of Google or Apple. And once there was a market entrant that kind of combined uh, all of the technical characteristics of of YouTube and and, Go and Google's offer or YouTube and uh, Amazon's offerings and Apple's offerings, um, and once that was beholden to the record labels, they could kind of sit down and decide how to divide up the extra shares that have been going to creators and take away all those benefits. That you know, a, a market composed of of uh, a few more giants is better than a market with just one giant. There is the possibility of like a temporary ceasefire in the war on on workers, but that temporary ceasefire only lasts as long as it takes for them to find some kind of common ground. And, you know, one of the things in our corporate story is to impute, you know, not just corporate personhood, but corporate personality uh, and even beyond the kind of Hobby Lobby sense where we say things like, oh, well, Disney is the kind of company that would never make the kind of entertainment that Fox would make because they're very different companies, which leaves us to wonder, you know, were, were Bob Iger and Rupert Murdoch star-crossed lovers who secretly, you know, gazed yearningly across the, the quad at each other from the windows of their corporate towers? Or were they secretly like always on the same side with a little bit of kind of cosmetic difference at the periphery about whether Bart Simpson would make a fart joke and Mickey Mouse wouldn't? Uh, and where all those differences could be erased when the shareholders uh, interests were were raised and uh, and especially when it held the possibility of eliminating residuals and other forms of payment to creators, which was the major outcome of the, the Disney Fox merger. Can I jump in with one more thing about YouTube and TikTok? Um, we put that in a separate category, a special category in the book, right? Um, and the, the, the chapter heading for that one is called Baking Trick Points In. So what we point out is that with YouTube, they had way less of these lock-in characteristics than any of the other creative markets that we looked at, right? That it is, I mean, in some ways it's tricky because I think there's a lot of content there, but if a lot of creators decided to take all of their content to another platform and like they re-uploaded it and they encouraged all of their users to follow them or like something like TikTok, you know, just offered a different kind of technology that was attractive to people and then like a whole new TikTokers, for example, like sprang up, then they, they didn't have that set their, their users locked in in the same way as any of the other businesses. But then the, um, the EU decided to pass those internet filters, right? That only the, and, and they are drafted in a way, despite lots of warnings that this is exactly what was going to happen, they were drafted in a way that really gave small competitors, like a new upstarts who had very limited access to capital markets, extremely limited protections. And YouTube initially fought the adoption of those, those internet filters, but then at some point they changed their tune, right? And they're like, well, okay. And I'm sure that we're, we're sure that someone at YouTube and at Google noticed that, okay, we don't really have our users locked in now, but we have spent over a hundred million dollars on content ID. Right, that gives us a huge advantage over any other company that wants to compete with us on this. 
And so regulate, you know, these companies would prefer not to be regulated in a way that, you know, just, um, prevents their dominance. But if there's regulation in a way that cements their dominance, then they're all in favor of that. And so that would be my response. Like maybe it's going to be a little bit too late. Maybe the potential of TikTok is so strong now that it will be able to get access to these capital markets. It will be able to solve the copyright problem. But what about the next entrant after that? So, uh, so actually, I want to talk uh, before we get into the audience questions. I want to talk actually about some of your solutions because uh, some of the things you said, including uh, the reference to privacy, uh, uh, raise a dilemma that Mark Lemley has written about uh, at length, which is. Um, some of the things that you would do to increase competition would pretty clearly be bad for users in terms of product quality. So, and, and so, so imagine a world in which Google doesn't have all your data. Instead, you know, 50 different apps actually have all your data, right? We can, so aside from sort of a, an attack surface for people uh, who, who, you know, aren't going to have the engineers that Google has, right? There's just like lots more that can happen if there are 50 different custodians. So talk a little about the conflicts between competition and other aspects. And, and, and right, like without, you know, I like Marvel movies, right? Uh, it, you know, it's nice to have a studio that can spend $200 million on a movie. Uh, you can convince me that it's, it's not worth it, that I'm actually quite open to that. But um, like uh, the, the product quality issues seem actually worth talking about. So. Yeah, uh, so I, I think that, you know, this, this idea of, uh, you know, nominating a firm to step in and, and uh, fulfill the role of the state, solve the problems that it creates has, has some pretty obvious problems, right? Which is that firms will act to protect their users uh, from everyone except themselves. So I, I, I often talk to uh, security researchers and security professionals at conferences like DEF CON, and I'll enumerate the problems of these uh, corporate silos, what you know, Bruce Schneier calls them uh, uh, technological feudalism. Uh, I always hear from historians who say, no, no, it's technological manorialism, because if it were feudalism, you'd have to raise an army. But uh, in, these, in these technological manners where, um, we are, you know, we have a, a warlord who says, move into my keep and I will defend you from the bandits who, who range outside, who are identity thieves and uh, fraudsters and uh, hog butchers and all of the other horribles that we have on the internet here inside my castle, we'll keep them out. I've hired all these, you know, ferocious mercenaries to to bristle at the battlements on your behalf. And that's entirely true, right? Like when I, when I speak at, at tech conferences, at security conferences, those people will come up and say, like, you have no idea the threat actors that we keep out of Facebook and Apple and Google and Microsoft and so on. And I completely agree with them. The thing is that when Apple or Google or Microsoft decides to make a meal of us, then the fortress becomes a prison, right? Then the, the, um, uh, it, it's like that line out of the Watchmen, right? I'm not locked in here with, with you. You're locked in here with me. Uh, and um, we are really at their mercy, and those guys and women's bosses will pay them to defend me against all comers, except for their bosses, who you know on whose behalf they will step aside. And so when Apple says, "Oh, well, we're going to be the world's most pro-privacy company, and we're going to allow you to opt out of tracking," it's true they do, unless you're in China, in which case they use the fact that they are the only people who can. Uh, a green light an app for your mobile device to ensure that there are no working privacy tools available for your mobile device so that the Chinese state can spy with you impuni with impunity and you know round you up and arrest you and torture you and whatever or or here closer to home apple just nuked an app called uh, the OG app which uh, is an alternative instagram client that uh, just strips out the ads and all of the incredibly invasive tracking that happens even on iOS and just lets you see your feed uh, of your friends uh, in reverse chronological order without any kind of algorithmic uh, um, moderation. 
uh, which is a thing that, you know, 12,000 iOS users wanted to do in the first six or seven hours that that app was live for until Apple decided to remove it for, quote, violating Facebook's terms of service, but without ever saying why or, or which terms they, they've gone after. So again, Apple is your defender until it's not. Now, there is a way to make sure that Apple and Facebook and these other firms defend you uh, against their shareholders' worst ideas, and that's to regulate which conduct they can and can't engage in. But then we run up against the problem of regulating in the face of a monopoly, right? And in, in a, you know, when you are trying to resolve a highly technical regulatory question like what's the best way to run a social media network, uh, if if all the entities who are qualified to answer that question work for you know say two or three companies, <clears throat> it's very easy for them to show up at your truth seeking exercise and address their regulator and say, I think you'll find that the way that we're doing it is the best way to do it. It's really the only way to do it. Uh, and so you would be uh, you know, foolish to try and regulate otherwise, you old clueless people and your, your series of tubes and your dump trucks full of data. Uh, you don't really get technology and you can't. Um, you know, We have lots of technical realms that we regulate in and we've regulated well, right? You're in a room right now whose ceiling hasn't fallen in on you because someone specified the, uh, the characteristics of the alloy and the, the thickness of the metal and the mechanisms by which they'd be joined and the stresses they would have to be able to endure. And the fact that you know, you're not sitting in a pile of rubble speaks well of that regulation. But if there was just one company doing all the building and they showed up at the regulator and said, oh, no, 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 we're overbuilding. We should, you know, we should be able to cut our costs by 50%. And there was no one credible to offer counter contrary advice. If that was not true, it would still stand a good chance of becoming the rule. And then you would be sitting in a pile of rubble. And so really, if we're to have a, a, a system in which firms do represent our interests, um, it, it can't be a system which in which firms are so large that they can capture their regulators, because then the the only interests of ours that they will stand up for are the interests that don't conflict with their shareholders' interests. And uh, there is a kind of ever-widening constellation of things that are good for the public and bad for shareholders. And uh, that means that it, without some kind of effective reining in of corporate power, there will be an equally widening constellation of harms inflicted on the public uh, in the name of defending shareholder interests. So let, let me do a little more pushback um, and then I want to let the audience ask questions. Um, so I, I think we ought to actually uh, pay. Uh, th there is something about the manorial bargain, um, which is in particular, I mean, I think you're right. Apple will ruthlessly exploit us to the best of its ability, but it won't, what it won't do is drain my bank account, right? Uh, so that is uh, like, there's a reason that you end up with Apple uh, or I suppose that like you choose your crypto provider, uh, and and uh, but you know there there's there's different levels of risk uh, and exploitation, um, and I also just want to suggest like I just don't see how more competition could fix the problem in China, like the government is going to want the surveillance no matter what, and. So figuring out how to deal with the cross-border implications of that is quite difficult, and uh, you know, and uh, you might get a little uh, more traction in, say, in sort of the stuff that we can re reasonably expect to solve. And so the last thing I want to say about that is, um, you know, it's it's absolutely true. Being able to capture the regulator is hugely important. We really need to deal with that uh, on a political level. But regulating a field of tiny businesses is no picnic either. Mm -hmm. And one, and so uh, I think of a couple of things. First, uh, think of pharmaceuticals versus supplements in the United States. So supplements are basically unregulated uh, for because in part because a bunch of small sellers, if you have a bunch of small sellers, then every congressperson gets a visit from the person in their district that, who benefits from not being regulated. And that is important too. And this is also actually why the, the video rental stores uh, escaped regulation because the, the lobbyists actually brought the, a person from each member's district to meet that member, to leave us alone. Um, and so, you know, th th there are complex trade-offs, right? So yes, pharmaceuticals can definitely kill a lot of people. It's very expensive. There's a lot of problems. On the other hand, uh, you know, there's not too much lead in your Novavax 
and there is a non-trivial amount of lead in supplements on the shelves, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and so, uh, so, you know, is the ideal version a world of, you know, sort of mid-sized firms? Is the ideal version a world in which the government actually just tells everyone exactly what they can and can't do? Like what's, you know, what's Nirvana look like? So the answer to this is that it's different in all different circumstances, right? So we're looking in the book, what we do when we talk about it. So the whole second half of this book is our design around solutions. What we really didn't want this to be is yet another of these, what we call chapter 11 books. You know, the ones we've all read them is 10 chapters about how dismal everything is and terrible and the like the sky is falling. And then there's one chapter to sort of wrap up all the loose ends of like, well, we really should do something about this, but oops, we don't have time. A bit of hand waving, as Corey says, very harder, like that's what you should do. Um, we didn't want to be that book, right? We set up the first half to show that the problem here is not that there's not enough copyright. It's not that artists aren't working hard enough. It's that we've got this power imbalance. But then in the second half, when we get to the solutions, what we acknowledge is that there are so many different ways in which we can remedy this. Right. And so sometimes it might be that we really do want to encourage new entrants into the market. And so, for example, we talk about how we might rethink um, statutory licenses or compulsory licenses so that once, for example, some music is licensed to one of the streaming giants, then everybody can license it, which you know might be possible um, if we had appropriate regulation for those and we streamlined the, the collecting societies and made it much more um, efficient to match payments to creators. Another thing that we talk about is transparency rights, which is one that could you know, really help in the context of some of these situations we're talking about. One of my favorite stories, but also one of the most horrifying stories in the book is around Audible Gate. I don't know how many of you have followed this scandal and how many, like it should have reached everybody's ears, but I'm not <laughs> sure that it did. This is an astonishing story about how when um, there were uh, all of the independent authors and small publishers who get their books onto Audible. They have to do that by going through a, 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 an Audible-owned platform called ACX. ACX, like all Amazon companies, is notoriously secretive. And all, like all Amazon companies, it's determined to lock in users, right? So, you know, once you have signed up to Audible and you've got a subscription, they really want you to keep subscribing because that's what helps keep everybody locked in, which means that publishers and authors don't have a choice, which means they get to extract more and more money. And so one of the ways that they were doing that was by offering this extraordinarily generous returns policy, yeah? So that you could buy a book, you could listen to the whole thing, you could really enjoy it, but you'd be getting these emails going, do you want to return it for a full credit, maybe, by any chance, any time in like the next year? Like if you do, just press this one button and that'll be like completely fine, no questions asked. Um, and what they were doing, it was this scam, right, where they would return the book to the subscriber, sometimes like multiple times, um, and all of those royalties would be clawed back from, from the independent author who had paid for that book. And then they hid this because they knew that nobody would be happy if they found out this is what was going on. They hid it because they only reported net sales, right? So you might be like, oh, I sold five books today. No, you sold 15 books today, but... 10 books were returned from people who'd bought them previously. And so it shows up as five. And the only way anyone found out what was going on, although people were suspecting something was up, they couldn't do anything about it because you can't fight an enemy if you don't know what they look like. And so one day there was a data glitch and three weeks of returns data showed up in a single day. All right. And so everybody suddenly saw, wow, this returns thing is way bigger than we thought. And that's what allowed them to mobilize these authors um, uh, led by this incredible writer and now activist called Susan May. They started this campaign under the Audible Gate and um, Amazon must, uh, Audible Must Pay hashtags. Um, they mobilized. And you know, even though this is a really, really powerful company, together they were able to, um, to so far already get some, some changes to the way the um, royalties are reported, some changes to the clawback of, of revenues in the case where a book is returned. Um, and the change the lock-in they were when they decided to boycott audible as a result of this they were told well you can't because you've all agreed to seven year contracts with us that you can't withdraw your books even though you're the one that paid fully for the cost of the book um, onto the platform we also saw just an aside to this um, there was another woman who was really closely involved in this campaign called Colleen Cross a former forensic accountant turned writer of financial fraud thrillers. And she started, like she found herself in like one of her own plots here. She started thinking, well, hang on a minute. If, um, if this is what's happening, if this is what they're doing to us with the return scam, 
what are they doing around our royalties? And so she took that forensic eye to the contracts and the royalty statements. And she found, hang on a minute, if they were actually paying us the way the contracts say they're supposed to be paying us, actually, this doesn't make any sense. The numbers don't add up. And so she thinks that between the return scam and the, the problems with the royalty payment, that there's hundreds of millions of dollars missing that should have gone into creator pockets. Now, this is still really hard for them to get a remedy on because, again, they've got these contracts that prohibit the bringing of class actions. You know, so that's one thing that we can do. We can get rid of those. We can get rid of those kinds of um, um, of um, misuses of the legal system. Um, we can make other contractual changes too, um, as Corey points out, because of where uh, all contracts, nearly all contracts that govern a creator contracts, nearly all contracts that govern creators and the way they get paid are uh, formed in California or Washington State or what's the other one, Corey? Uh, it's uh, New York. New or New York, right? And so contracts are governed by state law. Right. What we could do is we could prohibit abuses on audits of contracts, right? This is another thing where we commonly see you've got contracts that um, that stop auditors from looking in certain places. That might be where the bodies are buried, um, that uh, prevent you from hiring an auditor that's already auditing the company. That knows where the bodies are buried, right? Um, and that prohibits you from joining together with other creators to do it. Right. Um, we also know that um, often, like if you do get past all of that and you audit a company and you find that they did owe you money, then they'll probably refuse to, to give you that money unless you sign an NDA, right? Which means you can't use that to say to your fellows, oh, hey, I know where there's some treasure buried with your name on it, right? So we can make changes to contract law in those states too. Um, so all of these interventions together, right? And in different circumstances, these are the kinds of powerful things that we can do to widen those trick points out. It doesn't always have to be, well, we have to break this down into 5 billion atomized companies, you know, but it might be some circumstances where having, you know, local sellers and facilitating the ability to have local sellers makes sense. Well, uh, so this would be a great opportunity to start taking questions, including from our online audience. Uh, uh, so um, if, if anyone here wants to get us started, we can also see if there are questions. So I see the gentleman in the back. Yeah, I, I have a couple. I have a couple of questions actually. Uh, the first one is many of the uh, the problems that you discussed. Choke point capitalism reminds me of the concept of competitive bottleneck, uh, which is also a, con a concept of competition law analysis and. Um, we have solutions in other jurisdictions, or um, they, yeah, at least it's tried to offer other solutions. And yeah, one solution that directly came to my mind is the Digital Markets Act in Europe, uh, which has several um, yeah, uh, provisions that might seem to match what you are asking for. So um, allow business users to steer away users from the gatekeeper platform, mandate interoperability, a mandate to allow different app stores on a certain device, mandate gate gatekeepers to provide data for business users on how, which transactions they have generated on the platform um, and so on. Um, I know that this is at least partly not what US interest law is at the moment. For instance, if you look at anti-steering provisions, Ohio versus American Express has a yeah quite favorable view on this and the DMA is yeah, actually prohibits it. So, um, but yeah, one is regulation and the other is competition. So um, do you think that would be my first question that the US, uh, sorry, the EU is on the right track. Yeah, do you think that we are? Yeah, and we talk about this in the book as well. And the Digital Single Markets Directive has got some um, direct, direct interventions to help creators. So things like um, use it or lose it rights that you may have transferred your, assigned your copyright uh, over to a producer. Uh, but if they stop using it, then you can get those rights back. Um, rights to fair and proportionate remuneration um, and um, transparency rights as well, like what I was talking about a little a little while ago. So, um, as I said, one of, one of those ways that we can um, address monopsony power that we know works well is by directly regulating buyer power. These are some examples of that, and by um, increasing countervailing power in producers and suppliers, and they they do that as well. Um, so, absolutely, and yeah, we do talk about some of those comparative interventions quite a bit in the book. And, and I'll say that I'm a great fan of, of interoperability mandates, and I think that uh, they can do a lot of good. I think the Access Act here in the U.S. is very promising legislation, albeit not one that is very promising to pass in this session, but uh, promising as a, as a set of remedies. 
The Digital Markets Act it has um, many excellent characteristics, including its interop. I am dismayed, however, that they decided to start with what I think is probably the hardest interop challenge, which is end-to-end -end encrypted messaging. Uh, and I think that that opens substantial risk to both Europeans and people around the world because end-to-end -end encrypted messengers are such a target, particularly of, of, of uh, oppressive regimes and breaks in end-to-end -end encrypted messaging, such as those uh, sold by cyber arms dealers like the NSO group, have been implicated in really ghastly human rights abuses, including the, the murder and dismemberment of Jamal Khashoggi. And I think saying, right, right we're going to start with interop, and we're going to start with end-to-end -end encrypted messaging, and you've got two years to do it, don't make any mistakes, is actually not just uh, unsafe uh, and, and create substantial risk, but also creates a risk to the whole project of interoperability, which I think is hugely important. Uh, I think we over-index on the ability of um, network effects to drive scale in tech firms and, and largely ignore the fact that low switching costs really counter those network effects. That, you know, the fact that digital technology is intrinsically interoperable, that computers are universal, means that once you've got everyone inside of your silo, it's very easy for someone else to come along and plug something into your silo that lets them leave again uh, and take with them whatever value they were getting when they were stuck inside your silo. and. Um, I am worried that if we start by saying, right, you've got two years to do interop for messaging, and the result is that you see mass scale breaks against intended crypto messengers with an accompanying parade of horribles, that it's going to turn people off of interop altogether. I think we should do interop in encrypted messaging. I just think that it's going to take more than two years. So, I mean, to me, this highlights, like, there's a reason that people are skeptical about governments. So uh, by the very mm -hmm. same token, there, there, there's a reason that they're doing encryption first. Uh, it's because they want to read your mail, yeah. right? Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, the, I guess one other side of this is the deterioration of non-business sort of third institutions that stand between the individual and the government. That, like, we want somebody to be able to stand up to us against the you know the security services and uh, right now Apple seems like the only candidate. Well, except for the Chinese ones, um, well, yeah. you, you know. And I think that you make an excellent point. I think though that um, the larger firms are, the larger states have to be to counter their power. That one way to get an effective small smaller state is to have smaller firms as well and make one of the primary duties of that state to ensure that the firms don't get so big that they're too big to fail or too big to jail. Uh, such that they they can both you know avoid this arms race that the firms have to get bigger to to womp the state and the state has to get bigger to womp the firms. I don't know if the reason they're doing this is because they can't uh, they want to read your email. I think that there are lots of or your messages. I think there are lots of elements within states in the European Union who do. A bunch of them are customers for the NSO Group software, so it would be naive to think that they weren't. I think personally, based on conversations with people in the Commission that it's literally just because none of them are old enough to remember Usenet and federated social media, but all of them have sent an SMS from a German phone in Brussels to a Dutch colleague in Spain and had it arrived. And they think it's a solved problem. I think they literally just can't imagine it. I, I just released a project with the Electronic Frontier Foundation called Interoperable Facebook. That's meant to be kind of part essay and part uh, user manual for a hypothetical interoperable social media platform that involves consent and privacy uh, that um, would allow people to leave Facebook but stay in contact with the people who matter to them there. And, and the hope there is that it can infuse some you know, kind of imaginative possibility into the debate so that we're not stuck with with just, you know, those few of us who can remember Usenet being the, the last torchbearers for federated social media. I think we have a couple more questions that we can take from the online audience. Um, the first one's pretty interesting and goes back to, I think, an original point that Rebecca G made at the beginning, which is to think about the negative side effects of all these things, not the only way to move forward with this. Um, this person's question is, is there, is there a possible world likely one arising from heavy regulations in which mon, mon I can't say this word, monospony, mon it's, it's, it's hard to make so it fancy. hard, that Monopsons. word, Monopsons. Um, slash monopolies or some kind of central authority exists, but isn't a problem, but is instead actually good for everyone. Um, I'm thinking of how Bellamy describes things working and looking backward, admittedly a fictional piece, um, but universal socialism. 
Well, look, like I was saying before, I, I do, we, we don't come out and say there is one solution and here is a perfect world. What we are trying to do is show a different way of thinking about the problem. If we accept that the problem is one of power imbalance, right, um, which is what we try and persuade you in the first half of the book, and that it's not about there not being enough copyright and so on, then how do we fix those power imbalances? And that there is a broad range of tools. And I think some areas call for greater regulation in greater circumstances. In others, these other tools that we talk about can really help. Um, and so I, I do think at the very least, there are vastly better ways of doing this than what we've got now that can um, enable creative workers to get more of a fair share from creative labor. Hey, thanks so much for, for talking today. I was wondering, um, you talked a little bit about how contracts, uh, we could change contract law, which is sort of, as you mentioned, a matter of state law. So I'm wondering if you could talk more about the role of judges in a lot of this. I think we know in the, in the antitrust and monopoly context, we have a lot of judges who've been you know, indoctrinated with the law and economics uh, sort of view of things. Um, and so um, are, are coming at this from a very particular perspective. I was interested as to whether you think Maybe you do that there's sort of similar uh, forces at work on the, the contract interpretation side. And if so, what are the types of, of education or re-education projects that might be required to make that come out a different way? Yeah. What I think, where I think this is really hurting creators is that there's this false dichotomy, right? Where co the copyright reform discourse is constantly positioned as being about creators versus users. And you're told to pick a side, right? Now, I, I work for artist rights and access to knowledge and culture, so I refuse to, but I think many, many people, Rebecca, who work in intellectual property and copyright also want those two things. They want artists to get paid fairly for their work and they want widespread access to knowledge and culture. Now, this framing, however, that suggests that any time that you want to reduce the collateral damage that comes from the current approaches to copyright means that you would like creators to starve and not be able to feed their families, right? This is the kind of thing that I think has uh, indoctrinated the judiciary in this space, right? So we saw the Sonny Bono, Sonny, Sonny Bono Term Extension Act uh, was all about how we need to protect creators and their heirs, right? Who can object to that? Except the way the law was actually framed did not give them, gave them almost nothing, right? a little, little bit of a tweak to the termination law, if they'd already transferred their rights to an intermediary and nearly all of the works that still had value at the point where the term extension would result in anything at all, nearly all of those were owned by um, corporations by this point. And so nearly all of the rewards for that would have flown as win flowed as a windfall profit into those corporate coffers. Okay, but that's one example of how this idea, this romantic idea of artists and authors and creators, the fact that we really do feel these strong motivations to, um, to protect them and, and get them paid can play out in a way that achieves something that doesn't actually do that. If we really cared about that, then we would have secured those rights directly to the creators, right? And given them a chance to resell them to corporations, get another bite at the cherry, All right? So if we're gonna take any sort of pivot point of re-education, I think it's gotta be that to show that not only is this a false dichotomy and at the very, very least it's a triangle where you've got creators and investors and users, but then of course we're still like vastly oversimplified here. But I think what we should be refocusing on the question of what do we want copyright to achieve and how do we better target it to do so and with less collateral damage than our current approaches. And, and for me, I, I wanna talk about um the idea that you can hill climb your way to victory rather than planning planning a route that that a heuristic is better than a map when the terrain is very complex uh that you know i don't i don't know how we unwind 40 years of uh neoliberalism and and tolerance for and welcoming of uh extreme concentrations of corporate power but i i know given a series of possible interventions whether one or more of them ascends the gradient towards a world where there's uh, less corporate power, more pluralism, more accountability. And I feel like at, uh, at, at each juncture, we can intervene in ways that allow us to ascend that gradient, attain new terrain, and from that new vantage point, espy 
new pathways that might take us even more steeply up that gradient. And so, you know, today we fix the contracts in three states to ensure that creators have more uh, royalties. Uh, and then tomorrow we take creators who are now feeling less pressure to pay their mortgages and we ask them to organize to resist the next mega merger. And we use the political clout that arises from that to uh, um, embolden uh, regulators or lawmakers to introduce new policies or laws. We also use the kind of political groundswell uh, to encourage investors to invest in new firms, uh, to encourage creators to throw their lot in with firms that do, could do a better deal or form cooperatives. Uh, all of those things are, are an iterative process. They will have many reversals um, and they are not as clean as plotting a novel where you say, I know where my characters are starting and I know where they're going to end up and I'm going to plot the most interesting and, and satisfying dramatic arc course from A to B, but that's novels. <laughs> and in the real world, there, you, you are um, not just contesting against your own imaginative capacity to dream up a path from A to Z, uh, but you are also uh, contesting against adversaries who are rearranging the terrain as you go because the, they don't want you to ever reach Z. And so if you spend all your time drawing maps, you'll never leave A, uh, because by the time the map is done, you'll have to draw a new one. One more question from the audience. Yeah, I have actually a question that follows up on what you asked, um, because if you think of changing state law um, and the rules differ in the, in the different US states, then it makes me think of uh, experience with regulatory competition between the US states and other fields of the law. Um, and there's much research, for instance, in corporation law and their regulatory competition, of course, you can discuss, is it to the top or to the bottom? But in essence, as my, my impression is that it's business friendly. So Delaware, the leading corporation law is a business friendly corporation law. And would you fear that the same might happen with um, copyright law or other laws? So might the states be interested in having a law that's attractive for the big internet giants using it so that it's yeah, widely used throughout the USA and this might be yeah, profitable for the local bar or whatever. So that would be the first question. The, the second Thank question- you, Maybe you only got time for that one, but I'm very happy to answer that. Um, and the answer is yes, the states are like that. Um, in California, there was a really big push in the early part of this century to, um, to change the, the rules around audits, right? In exactly those ways that I talked about. Um, and it was watered down and watered down. I think eventually it was defeated. Um, uh, but at the same time, what we saw was that this was all happening around the same time of the Napster Wars, right? Where we had the advent of the internet, um, like the popularization of the internet and digital technologies, which, you know, we don't want to overly romanticize this period. There was blood on the walls, right? Like the, suddenly for so many people, revenues that they've been living on just suddenly disappeared. But also it had the effect of creating all of these different um, pathways for people to make money from music on the internet and the development of new revenue streams. And it resulted in way less reliance on those, those big three record labels. And it meant that for people who were signing up to new record deals, not the ones who were bound to the old ones that last forever, but to new record deals, the, the um, royalty rates just kept going up and up and up because there were suddenly these record labels had to compete with other technologies, okay? And so even where you've got like this, this overt corporate power that can defeat the kind of regulation that makes a lot of sense, um, where you have other ways of widening the trick points out, which is exactly what the, the beginning of the popularized internet did before we had these companies take advantage of the current antitrust law and start closing them back in again, that's another pathway to get there. So again, we're not suggesting that there's any one particular way that you need to take, but just that analogy Corey used, it's the first time I've heard him say that, and I think it's really great and I'm gonna to totally steal it. But yeah, one step at a time and, and figure out the best path forward. And I, I want to cite the work of, of someone I think will be familiar to everyone there at Harvard Berkman, which is James Boyle. And Jamie, you know, he talks about the prehistory of the word ecology and how the emergence of ecology as a term of art absolutely altered the way that we thought about who we were allied with and where our power lay. And that before the term ecology came into wild, wide parlance, it wasn't clear that if you cared about owls and I cared about the ozone layer, that we cared about the same thing. You, you know, your concern for 
you know, charismatic nocturnal avians is not immediately connected to my worries about the gaseous composition of the upper atmosphere, but the term ecology turns a thousand issues into one movement. And I, I think that, you know, the point that how will we check corporate power when it's so mobile and when there are 50 states that they can choose as venues, plus the district and Puerto Rico uh, and Guam and whatever. And uh, and and what will we do about uh, the fact that 40 percent of the judiciary attended a Manet seminar and came back brainwashed about the efficiency of monopolies? And these are not easy problems. I don't want to hand wave them away. We're going to eat that elephant one bite at a time. And the, and, and the way that we're going to do it is by assembling a coalition of other people who have been harmed by monopsony and monopoly because there is there are so many people who have endured so many harms as a consequence of this uh yesterday i i uh reviewed a, an article uh an ssrn preprint um who, one of whose co-authors was uh, richard posner's son eric posner about how monopoly power uh, achieved its degree of tolerance in in our uh system of governance and regulation and they just casually toss in you know that one of the consequences of the monopolization of the dialysis market is just this like kind of grisly death toll like just just you know genuine american carnage you don't need to to go to the fantasies of donald trump to find american carnage you can find it outside dialysis centers and all of those people think that their problem is you know their kidneys and there are their uh the, and and uh and and the uh the problems of of their healthcare company and their insurer and really their problem is one of monopoly and they don't know it right they they, they think they're fighting their own corner uh, when we tell them that the problem of monopoly is the same whether you're angry that there's only one cheerleading league which is currently embroiled in like a toe curlingly horrible sexual abuse scandal that arose mostly because of unchecked power because there was just one league because they bought all the other ones or whether you're angry that there's only two companies that make all the beer or three companies that do all the shipping or one company that makes all the eyeglasses or, or three companies that that do all the, the record publishing or or you know four companies that do all the books you're angry about the same damn thing and and once those people understand that they are part of a coalition then we will have real broad-based power and i don't think it's a small fight and i don't think it's a small challenge i think it's a giant challenge but it's an existential one you know the monopoly of the oil market the energy market is where the excess rents came from to run a disinformation campaign that has literally threatened the future of our species it's it, we we need to um uh smash monopoly wherever we find it not just for creators incomes but for the future of the human race That seems like quite the note yeah. to, <laughs> to end on. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, and let's say thank you to our authors.